Well, good morning. We are so glad you're here this morning. Welcome to First Melissa. It is good to have you here, and we're so glad that you've decided to join us this morning. Um, as always, we say it every week, uh, but it's true every week. We cannot wait to see what God has got in store for us today, because we know it is going to be good, uh, even if it hurts a little bit. Um, and, you know, I'll throw this in for free. If you come to church a lot and <laughs> God never hurts you a little bit, then something's, something's not quite right because uh, none of us are perfect yet, but we're working to be more and more like Christ every day. And so we're glad you're here today because I promise you our God has got something for us. We're going to pray and we're going to worship and we're going to see what he's got. So let's bow together. And uh, we'll get things started. God, we thank you for this day. God, we do believe that you've got something for us. God, we do believe uh, that we are here today to be changed by what we hear, God, by what your word says to us. Father, we are here today because we want to know you or we want to know you better. And so, Father, I just pray today that that would be what everything here today points to. God, let our worship time just draw us close to you. God, let us be reminded of who you are and all that you mean to us. And then God, let it just open our hearts to be ready for the word that you've brought us from here for. Father, we love you and we pray it in your precious name. Amen. Okay, well, let's lift our voices together. We're going to praise God here in this place today. And uh, it's probably not going to hurt if you put your hands together, at least for this first one. Let's lift up our God and celebrate his greatness. <clears throat> Need to see some hands doing this. Good stuff. And then I need us to lift our voices together and praise the everlasting God. Strength arises.
rises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not faint. You song for us out of Psalms.
The king is coming, the king is coming. Father, let your kingdom come. Uh, lift that up together. With all creation, we raise our voices high into the risen sun. The king is coming, the king is coming. Father, let your kingdom Continue praising the name of Jesus here in this place. We honestly cannot praise him enough. So let's just lift up his name.
many words, I think, in Scripture to describe God and who He is and His characteristics, His various names. But if you had to condense it down to just one word, I think Scripture and Revelation, and I think what we know about Him, would use the word holy. And so as we worship together with this, focus on that word. There's one word to describe our God, and that's holy. Let's lift him up. proceeding from your throne. I can see the lightning. I can feel the thunder. I can hear the voices proceeding from your throne. 24 elders bowing down. Casting down their crowns of
Father, God, we come today and simply celebrate your holiness. And God, we just simply ask that you would draw us close to you. God, speak to our hearts here today. We are here for you. Prayed in your precious name. Amen. 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 Good morning. You may be seated. Welcome to you today. It is our honor to worship with you. I want to say good morning to you in the room. And of course, we welcome those who are watching on the video screen as well. Wherever you are in the world, it's a privilege to gather together each week to sing praises to the Lord, to study his word. And we thank God. God, for the beautiful gift of a church family. We want to pray for the members of our church family. We offer this each time we gather together. Would you allow us to pray with you and pray for you? If you received a worship guide in the room today, you'll notice there's a place to write a prayer need down on that little tear-off slip if you would like to do so. And if you would write it on that slip, you can drop it in one of the offering boxes that are in this room or in the foyer. But you may prefer to use the email address prayer at firstmelissa.com, especially watching on video, prayer at firstmelissa.com. We lift up the needs that are turned in every week through our staff and our prayer ministry, and we would love to take your family before the Lord. Our other side of the tear-off slip is if you happen to be a guest with us today and we haven't had a chance to meet you personally, we would love to say hello to you and welcome you. That's what that other side of the slip is for. Inside the worship guide, as always, you'll see it's a very busy time of the year. Lots of things happening. We have many ministries that are going on this week. We do gather every Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. for what we call Torah Tuesday. We study the weekly Torah portion together, and you're invited to join us Tuesday at 7 in the morning. Also, tomorrow morning begins a special project for the Sprouts Project, which is going on all month long, that is our goal to provide much needed supplies to those who are in Romania as a result of the war in Ukraine. Tens of thousands of refugees have fled both Russia and Ukraine into Romania, and we are partnering with our missionary friends in Romania, the Big Knights, and we are adopting these boxes and you'll see them when you leave in the foyer today they're a shoe box that you can pick up you can fill up with the prescribed items you'll get a brochure that looks like this that tells you the packing list and how to provide items either for babies or a more general box you can also help us with our bulk purchases of diapers and blankets as part of that we will have a group of ladies starting tomorrow morning at 9 a.m for four days this week who will be knitting hats and They will be providing these for the little babies and for adults, and you can be a part of that if you want to join in tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Come and learn how to knit if you don't know how to knit, because I don't know how to knit, but if you want to know how to knit, then come knit tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., and they'll teach you how, and it'll be part of our shipment that we'll be sending in a few weeks to Romania. That's starting tomorrow morning. Also, this Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m., one of the Fan favorites, the Texas Country Boys, will be here in concert, 6.30 p.m. right here. Kevin Barham and all of his guys will be in concert, 6.30 p.m. It's free. 
Come and join us on Wednesday night. There's a dinner at 5.30 if you'd like to be a part of that. And a week later is going to be another Wednesday event, Burgers and Bingo. And there's some seriously crazy bingo people around here. And so if you don't play bingo, you just want to be entertained by watching them play bingo. That's coming up the following Wednesday. It's a lot of busy stuff going on. And we thank you for doing ministry with us in lots of ways by giving and serving and inviting and studying together, volunteering. We thank you for doing ministry through your tithes and offerings. This is how we take the story of Jesus around the world. I mentioned the offering boxes in this room and in the foyer. If you prefer to give by cash or check, that's very simple to do. Most people choose to give electronically, firstmelissa.com slash give, or with our mobile app. So thank you for helping us do ministry around the world. And this month, You've gotten to meet a number of our special friends, our special guests who are helping us take the story of Jesus around the world. And this morning you get to meet another one of our special guests. So I would like you to welcome to the stage my friend Amanda Fritas, please. You see on the screen Amanda, Vitor, Lilia, they are in Brazil and they are living in Brazil, but they are part of our congregation. And they left us to go to Brazil to take the story of Jesus. And when we say that you are partnering with the gospel being taken around the world, that's 100% true. And one of those great examples is the Fritas family. Amanda, welcome. Tell Thank us you. the story. Good morning. Today I want to take you on a journey. I want to invite you to go on a journey with me 10 years back. You believe it or not, we've been in Brazil for a decade now, and we thank you very much for partnering with us and making that happen. Many of you are new, maybe you weren't there at the beginning, but some of you will remember, so I'd like you to go back with me and remember some of the ways God has blessed and the things he's done in the past 10 years. This was the very first day we had project in Lamarão, the first place we were called to in Brazil. We had nothing but a very inclined, open area of sand, and through people coming, the Goad family from here actually came, your donations over the, t over the years. We were able to develop that and improve. We had donations. You can go ahead. And lots of things were able to bless them. Our goal was always to reach out to meet their physical needs, mainly teenagers, so that we could share Jesus and meet their spiritual needs. So if, you can go ahead, please. So if you'll look, you can see where the Goad family came and spent an uh, impact week. Remember with me, we're going back and looking over this journey to give God the glory and praise him for all the ways he's blessed in the past 10 years. And also to look forward. And 10 years from now, when we look back, will we be able to see how has God used our lives for his kingdom? So we look here and you see, you'll remember, you'll remember some of their faces. You got their cards and you prayed for us for individual kids. I hope it's ringing a bell for some of you. Because of your giving, we're able to bless them with their uh, school supplies, celebrating their birthdays. Some of them didn't even know their birthdays before that. Um, different ways we bless them like that. And we, if you remember our biggest prayer request at Lamaron, spiritual darkness. Does that ring a bell for any of you? Spiritual darkness. We pray that God's light would be shown. And we can tell you today, thank you for your prayers because we know that his seeds were planted and the light of Jesus was shown in that community. So we praise God. These smiles on their faces would not have happened without your participation. The best gift of all, though, we know for sure was the gift of God's word. For five years we spent in this community, very impoverished, very violent community, and because of your giving and your participation, your prayers, we were able to take the gift of God's word. Most of these kids took a gift, a copy in their own language home with them. We taught them, we did Bible studies, you can, you can roll through it. We did Bible studies every time we met with them to teach them to love and appreciate the word of God and to try to apply it to their lives. We saw them grow. The very first day we asked them to memorize a Bible verse. Of course, they didn't even remember we'd asked them to, right? The next time they came back, all right, who's got the, member, the verse ready? No one remembered. We offered a cupcake. And from that, God began a new idea. And we began to motivate them. And, and actually, eventually, some of them knew more than 100 scripture they had memorized. God is so good, he poured his word into their hearts. And so we praise him for that. We even were able to share with them uh, two different years. We gave a bicycle away. And we had a tournament based on the scriptures that they had memorized. Some of the kids could even do more than 150. Let that challenge you maybe for a second. That's quite a, quite a chore there, but God is good and faithful, and we really praise him for what he did in that community. So the biggest praise of all, as a result of all that, we see that uh, some professions of faith came from that ministry there in that community. We had four for sure. Today, we keep in touch with them because we've not been there for five years now. We still see some that are following him faithfully in church today. 
continue to pray for them. I hope some of you recognize those faces. Maybe they were the individuals you had selected. So God is good and faithful. That was taken two years ago, actually. Since then, we've had a few more contact us, and their interest is growing, and they're also attending. So let's give God praise for that. We thank him so much for what he's done in that community. Amen. In 2018, we made a move to the southern part of Brazil. We started the same thing again. We pretty much just do like a church camp or Bible school all year long. So it's really, really fun, the, the privilege that God's given us. So we moved to this new community, and you see the area we had to work with. It wasn't inclined sand, but it was just major rocks. But because of your giving, we were able to improve that. We had a beautiful little area there that attracted them, a great place to play. But we also had a safer community, so we were able to go out and reach out into the park and the local parts of town. And we did the same project out there, there. Teamwork and discipline and responsibility and respect and always sharing God's word. And so we were able to do the same privileges, same things here. We had an older age group here, so we had two different ages going on that we're doing the project with. Still always pouring God's word into their hearts, encouraging them to memorize your donations. When we actually came to this location, there were about 12 people that were part of this two-year-old church. And you see all these kids that were growing and growing. And so God added and added and added to his church there. These kids would go on Sundays and Wednesday nights as well. So that was quite a blessing. Um, if you'll remember, there was a specific health need that one girl had, and you, First Melissa, made it possible for us to give her, take her back and forth to the necessary location where we lived and have a surgery, a, a doctor for her. And because of your giving, we we're able to take care of this girl and get eye surgery she needed or she was going to go blind. And so that was because of your giving. So God is so good. It's great to look back and remember the things that he's done. Isn't it neat to look back? So thank you for that participation as well. Again, there's no better gift than the gift of God's word. So at this new place, we brought, were able to get new Bibles and pour into these kids as well. It's beautiful to see a smile on these kids' faces when they receive their own copy of God's word. But there's one thing a little bit better than that, and that is to see them finally come to know Jesus. And we thank you so much, and we give God the glory for what he's done. Again, at this location, the same thing. We're teaching them to love God's word and Bible studies with them, encouraging them to memorize God's word. And so God's word has been poured out over all these kids' lives throughout Brazil over the past decade because of our partnership with you. It's a beautiful thing to see. At this new location here, at the second place we were at, he added a new ministry with, us, uh, with women. That was something that just kind of came from totally from God. We hadn't planned it, didn't think about it. But because of a result of actually the mom of the girl that had eye surgery, she was the one that started this idea. She asked to work out with me one day, and it grew and grew and grew. This picture you see here, myself and one other lady were part of that church. The rest are all outsiders, visitors that were coming. And so we're so excited and thankful to see God pouring his word into these women's heart. Our goal with the women's ministry is to show them you have value. Your God loves you and wants a relationship with you because they're very much treated like they're just an object there in Brazil. So was, many of these women wanted to do more Bible study and get to know God a little bit more. So we had studies with them as a result of that workout ministry. All of these things are possible because of your giving. Because we're not doing a day-to-day -day job like you have to do because you give. We're able to pour in and invest in these all hours of the day, invest in these Bible studies. So thank you for your participation. Just look at all these people who gave a profession of faith. I just want you to praise God with us. In Psalm 67, you can scroll through there. It says, let all the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And we want to praise God, and we want to be a part of celebrating and expanding that so more and more people will praise him as they come to know him as Savior. We are so grateful for his outpouring of love and his grace and all these salvations at this location. But actually, last year when we returned to Brazil, we had made another move. We are now at a new location, Jaraguá do Sul, which is in another state. Here we are there. We're not out in the middle of nowhere, but it is mountainous, you see there. So this time we've partnered with a church that's 21 years old. That's brand new for us. When we first moved 10 years ago, there was no church. We had nothing. And then when we moved to the second place, there was a two-year-old church, very young people, young in their faith. And here we are. Um, with this group that's 21 years old. The church is happening and going and doing, but they didn't have a teenage program, and so they asked us to, to go. We prayed through it, we went and we joined, and here we are doing all kinds of activities with them, with their teenagers, trying to build that program up. Uh, we took with us the women's workout program, we're doing that as well. You see all the different types of things we're doing. Actually, we don't have one day a week that we're not doing. There's one day we're not in charge, but the rest of it we're going and doing and busy all the time. Here you see the next one, you'll see here we're out um, evangelizing and reaching out. 
And that's another thing that's a, that's a beautiful thing for us is to see our daughter involved and in now reaching out and ministering and evangelizing as well. And you're as much a part of that. We thank you for your prayers for her over the years as well. Here you see our, our workout ministry. Again, it's growing. It's about half church people and a half women from outside the community that are not part of the church. But I have to tell you something real quick. As we were going and doing all of these things at this new location, every time... I would come home and, and I don't know where this phrase would come from, but I would say, man, you know, they've got it going on. They just do. There's so many people and it's working and it's really neat to be loved on and partner with these people because we haven't had that before. But man, my heart is called to just like, I want to go in the middle of the forest where they don't know Jesus. They've just not heard. I just kept repeating that phrase. Man, it's so great, but I just want to be in the middle of the forest. Well, about... Four days before we came to the U.S. this year, the beginning of June, our pastor made a trip nine hours away to a small congregation that our church helps out. And while he was there, he visited, his, the preacher asked, hey, can I show you a new place? And so he took him 30 minutes away and he said, look, I bought some land here because there's about 7,000 people that live in this little community. And there's only one church, but it's not a Bible preaching church at all. They don't really teach Jesus. And so, man, there's so many teenagers and kids here, and they are hungry for the word. And we sent this video to our church telling it the story, hey, pray that God will send workers here. And man, that just really spoke to my heart and my husband's heart at the same time. We didn't even see the video together, but we both, man, God may be calling. So we, we, we just show our interest. We get in touch with the preacher or whatever. What was the phrase I said? I want to be in the middle of the... Look at the name of the town. This is not the forest, but it's a town called Forest. That's all I can tell you. If God calls us, we're going to say yes and go. If God doesn't call us, we're going to say yes, we'll stay. So just pray with us. Whatever God says, we will go and do. And we want to thank you for your help and your participation. Isn't it fun to look back and remember some of the things? We could have gone on and on and on, all the blessings that God's done in the past 10 years. But we want to celebrate with you. We want you to be a part, continue to be a part, pray for us that we can continue to encourage people to celebrate God because he is worthy of our praise. So thank you. We do have uh, magnets that you can get if you'll remember to, when you get hungry, go to your fridge and pray that we'll be hungry for God's word and hungry to share him. So please meet us outside afterwards and we'd love to, to shake your hand and thank you personally and grab a magnet from us, okay? Thank you so much. Well done. We tell you all the time that you are part of telling the story of Jesus around the world. And this is just another example. You'll hear more next week about how we as a body of believers in the great state of Texas is helping people around the world understand who Jesus is. And who is Jesus? He's Redeemer. He's Savior. He's Messiah. He's King. He was also the master storyteller. And he helped people understand spiritual truth by helping them start with a simple story and go to a deeper meaning. And that's what a parable was. And that's the purpose of our teaching series right now called Story Time. It's to understand the parables of Jesus. Because remember, about one-third of everything Jesus is recorded as saying came in the form of a parable. We can't understand Jesus and his ministry if we don't understand his parables. Here's a chart for you. We have listed on this chart 39 different parables of Jesus from Matthew, Mark, or Luke. We've covered seven of them. Those are the ones with the check marks. We're going to cover three of them. They're all very short, and they all come from the Gospel of Luke chapter 14. So I invite you to find your way there in your own Bible or your phone app. Find your way to the Gospel of Luke chapter 14, and we're going to read three short stories that Jesus tells back to back. It's one long conversation, but the teaching style of Jesus was to mix in these stories, these parables along the way. So the scene is set for us in Luke 14 verse 1. It says, it happened that when he, Jesus, went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath. So we know where the story takes place in a personal home. One of the leaders of the synagogue invites Jesus over, it says, for uh, a meal or to eat bread on the Sabbath. It says they were watching Jesus closely. They wanted to know who he was. They wanted to know what he was about and how he would minister to those 
even on the day of the Sabbath. It says, there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. It's a swelling in the body, a swelling of the lymph nodes. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Jesus has been invited over to a dinner party, an after-synagogue lunch, and there just happens to be a man there who's noticeably sick. See, some types of diseases you can't see outwardly, but this man's disease, he was swollen. You could obviously see he was in medical need, and there's a great theory that this man wasn't there by accident. He was placed there as a test of Jesus. What would he do? How would he react to this man's needs? And so Jesus asked the supposed leaders, the supposed experts in the scriptures, is it lawful? Is it proper to heal on the Sabbath or not? And verse 4, it says they kept silent. They either didn't know the answer, they didn't want to say the answer, or most likely they were still trying to test Jesus. What would he do? They didn't want to give him any clues or any advice. They kept silent. So Jesus, it says, took hold of him and healed him. What a simple understatement. He took hold of him, he healed him, and he sent him away. Now that's not normally how it happened. When people were healed by Jesus, what was the usual response? To stay, to worship, to thank him, to appreciate him, to spend time in his presence. Jesus took him, healed him, and sent him away. And then Jesus, who doesn't, it's not recorded anyway, speak to the man who was healed. He instead speaks to the leaders who were watching all of this and said to them, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day. The idea of observe the Sabbath day and make it holy and make it a day of rest and worship is vitally important all through your Bible. But how do you live that out? And especially how do you live that out in an emergency situation? That's the question. And Jesus says, if one of your children falls into a well on a Sabbath day, are you going to just say, I can't do any work? No. The value of life is higher than the value of Sabbath observance. And you will come to the rescue of your child. You will even do it for your own animal. Would any of you not do that? And it says they could make no reply. Again, they were silent. So we said a minute ago that Jesus healed the man and then sent him away. Maybe he sent him away because Jesus was about to correct these guys. And maybe Jesus knew what we suspect and this man was brought there for a purpose. He was a plant. He was a prop. And Jesus did not want him to be humiliated anymore. So he sent him away so he could have a conversation with these people. Just a few notes to share with you. Jesus, it's recorded in the Gospels, performed seven different healings on Sabbath, on Shabbat. And this was the last of those seven. And it was the only time in the Gospels this disease of dropsy, this organic disease of the heart or the kidneys, this swelling. It's the only time this disease is mentioned. And Jesus heals him on the Sabbath day. And these were usually big festive meals, but the Pharisees, the self-righteous people, always wanted to know how others would react and how they would revere and keep holy the Sabbath day. So in verse 7, Jesus is at a dinner and he starts to teach a parable. Verse 7 of Luke 14, Jesus began speaking a parable, one of these teaching stories that we've learned about, that has a very simple setting, a very simple context, but there's always a special teaching at the end. So Jesus 
began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table. So Jesus is invited to this man's house for a lunch. The story of the healing, the incident of healing this man of dropsy is already over, but now it's time to sit down for the meal at the big dining room table, and Jesus is watching these guys, and they're all kind of jostling. They're all kind of staking out their spots. It's sort of like musical chairs, except there's no music. We're all trying to take a seat. We all want a good seat, and we want the better seat. Because sometimes you think that the better seat at the dinner party reflects, as this quote talks about, reflects your social standing. Well, because I'm a big shot, I should get a good seat. So sometimes you think your seat reflects your social standing. But as this writer says, sometimes the seat at the table creates your social standing. Because you may not be a big shot, but there is a big shot in the room and you want to make sure you get seated next to the big shot because you think that's going to help you out, make you look more impressive. Or this is where you start passing out your business cards and sharing your phone number and asking for some help. And Jesus is watching these guys at this dinner party pick out places of honor at the table. And after observing them and their, their fight for position, Jesus tells them a parable. So it starts in Luke 14, verse 8. Jesus says this parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast. Now, where is he? He's at a synagogue service luncheon. But he says, if you're invited to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor which is exactly what these guys have been fighting over for a while. Do not take the place of honor, for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him, by the host, and he who has invited you both will come to you and say, give your place to this man, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. Jesus said, let me give you some advice. If you're invited to a wedding, and you can look at all the seating and you see which one looks like the head table and if you make your way by your own decision not by invitation but by your own decision you make the way to the big chair the head chair because you think it's going to make you look good and everybody who's sitting in the worst of seats is going to see you up there he says be very careful because what if the host walks in and says excuse me that seat's taken and brings the dignitary in and now you have to get up and where do you have to go well the only thing that's left which is going to be what the worst seat in the house he said don't take the place of honor don't put yourself up as the important figure because you may think you can sit anywhere but the host of the party, he can place people where he wants. You know how the teacher at school can move the students around if they choose to. And if someone walks in who has that higher position, the higher social standing, and they move you, it's going to be a huge embarrassment to you. So what Jesus said is, don't do this. Don't put yourself out there like that. What should you do instead? Okay, now we're in verse 10, Luke 14. Jesus said, but when you are invited, go and recline at the last place. What did he say? He said, if you go to the dinner party and you put yourself in the first row and they make you move, you're going to be embarrassed. He says, don't do it that way. Do it this way. Go and recline at the last place, the back row, the worst spot, so that when the one who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. Notice the difference. When you put yourself on the front row, and then they make you move back 
to the back row, what has everybody seen? The whole crowd has watched you get demoted. But if you willingly pick out the lesser spot, the back row, the unimportant chair, and then the host sees you and says, oh, no, sir, we expect you, ma'am, we expect you to sit up here. And then what is the audience or the rest of the crowd going to see? See, you get promoted. What did Jesus say? For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. This is, of course, Luke 14, but it was often the case that Jesus, who is not only a student of the word, but a, the author of the word of God, back on that last slide, tw Proverbs 25 says, Do not claim honor in the presence of the king. Do not stand in the place of great man, for it is better that it be said to you, Come up here, than for you to be placed lower in the presence of the prince. So Jesus is teaching a parable, but this idea is not brand new. It was written hundreds of years earlier in the book of Proverbs. Jesus is talking to the religious crowd. He's talking to those who are students of the word, but we need to be reminded that humility is a challenge for everyone. Even the disciples of Jesus, two brothers named James and John, came up to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you which is a really big request. Okay, what is it you want me to do? And they said to Jesus, grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left in your glory. Two guys who knew Jesus, who loved God, who worshiped him as Messiah, who've heard his teachings, saw him do miracles. They knew him better than almost anyone else in the whole world. Even those guys said, we want the good seat. We want the place of honor. We want to be seen as the important figures. Humility is a challenge for everybody. So let's ask a few questions about us. How can we be humble people? Because you see, this challenge, this desire to puff ourselves up, it's not an ancient problem. It's a today problem. I've told you about all the people who give these very generous donations to organizations and they seem to always have a camera crew with them when it happens. How can we be humble people? How could we be a humble congregation? Over the last few weeks, you've met a number of our missions partners around the world. Why do we support them? Why are we involved in projects in these countries around the world? Why are we engaged in this Sprouts project, trying to minister to the refugees from Ukraine? Why? Why do we invite people to worship with us? Why do we tell other people about who the Savior is? Why? Because if our desire is to be a follower of the king, whose name is Jesus, then we're not going to pretend that we're the king. Humility is a challenge for everyone. It's true in our day. That's why in the book of Philippians, the apostle Paul said, Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. And then he goes on in Philippians 2 and says, you think that's hard. So you probably say, well, I wish I had a role model. And he said, you actually have the greatest role model of all, the king of the universe, Yeshua, Jesus, who humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. continues in Luke 14. Now we're at verse 12. Jesus has been speaking to the audience, the crowd, the invited guests of this dinner party. So now he turns to speak to the host, the leader. 
When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. See, the host has a different temptation. The host has a different challenge for humility than the guests do. The guests, what do we just talk about? They want to put themselves up into a better chair, the head table. But the host, Jesus said, here's how you work on your humility, because I know how dinner parties work, Jesus said. You invite the significant people, the important people, the people closest to you, the people you want to get close to, you invite them. You know why? Because you think they'll be obligated by social etiquette to invite you to their party. It's your way to get into the big parties. So you invite them as a strategy. Verse 13. Don't do it that way. But instead, when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And you will be blessed. Since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus says, you're inviting these so-called important people to your party. So they'll invite you to their so-called important party. But that's not humble. That's self-serving. Instead, invite the people to your party who will never have their own party. said they can't repay you they can't make you look important in society it says you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous he says if you really believe in God if you really walk with God your focus is going to turn from yourself to other people. Now, this is hard. It's hard in today's world. This is why humility is such a challenge. But it's all over the scriptures. Look what James said, chapter 1, verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And now, treasures on earth, we always think that means money. And it can mean that. But treasures on earth could also mean your earthly reputation. Your social standing. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So at this luncheon where Jesus is telling a story, someone calls out. Now we're in Luke 14 verse 15. When one of those who were reclining at the table heard Jesus say this, this man said to Jesus, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. So this man said, we all get to be with God in his final banquet, his messianic banquet. And so Jesus tells one more story. So we're now in chapter 14, verse 16, when this man is professing his confidence that he will be accepted by God for eternity, Jesus now tells another story. Now, we said it earlier today. We've said it all series long. If you don't understand the parables, you can't really understand Jesus. And here's another example today because the whole thing is parable after parable after parable. So here's one of the most Interesting settings I can give you. Jesus is now at a banquet telling a parable about a banquet. Matthew, I'm sorry, Luke 14, 16. Jesus starts a parable. A man was giving a big dinner, a banquet. He invited many people. And at the at dinner hour, he sent his slave to, those, to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is ready now. Now, This seems different because it's culturally different. You today, if you have a dinner party, you send out an invitation, you send out a a text or whatever you do, and you say, okay, dinner's at 6 o'clock at my house, and everybody shows up at 6 o'clock at your house. But that's not their culture. Okay, It's kind of like we have this thing in today's world called save the date. 
right? That's, you're, you're supposed to just block off the time, but that's not your real invitation. You get your real invitation later, but you got your first invitation earlier to save the day. Okay, the first invitation is we're having a dinner party at my house. That's step one. Step two, they will send out an announcer, a messenger to say, okay, everything's ready, time to come. Now, they don't live far apart. They're small towns. You're walking from house to house, right? But this second announcement is everything's ready. It's time to come to dinner now. Verse 18, but they all alike begin to make excuses. The first one said, I bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. Now, what happens? The man sets a dinner party, gives them the save the date. They all RSVP yes. And so what does he do? He orders a whole bunch of food for this big dinner party. And then when the announcer, the messenger goes out and says, time for dinner, these guys say, well, we can't come. And they give a bunch of silly and ridiculous excuses. I bought a piece of land. I need to go look at it. Are you telling me you didn't look at it before you bought it? Of course you did. Well, I need to go test out my oxen. You're telling me you never saw and tested these animals before you bought them. Of course you did. Well, I'm newly married, so I can't come. What does that have to do with anything? You bring your new wife. These are all ridiculous excuses. But guess what happens? Sometimes the Lord calls to us in the spiritual banquet and he invites us to come in and we reply and we turn down the spiritual invitation and we come up with some silly excuses of why I can't go there. So in this parable, this, the house owner sends the servant to go say it's time to come to dinner and they all decline. So verse 21 the slave came back and reported to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. He says, I'm not going to throw all this food away. I'm not going to have an empty dinner party. Go find everybody you can find and bring them here. So the servant does that. And he starts inviting people who would have originally been rejected. And then he invites them and they come in and they start eating. But he says, Master, what you have commanded has been done. There is still room. See, do you know how the banquet of God works? There are those people who are invited, but they have some sort of excuse and say, I don't want that. But God's not going to shut down his party. What's he going to do? He's going to keep inviting people. And the people that God invites are the ones that the world says you might reject. And once God has invited people who have said yes and come to his party, you know what he realizes? There's room for more people to be invited. And he keeps calling more to come. So the servant says, boss, I brought them all here, but there's still seats left. So verse 23, the master said to the slave, go out into the highways and along the edges and compel them or urge them to come in so that my house may be filled. Don't stop inviting people. Don't think someone's not worthy of your invitation. Keep inviting people. Go to the areas where other people ignore and invite them to come. So that my house may be filled. See, if God is the master of this banquet, he doesn't want any seats left unfilled. Now, I need to tell you something historically. This verse, Luke 14, 23, go into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in. I need you to know something extremely troubling about our church history. Not this congregation, but the Christian church at large in history. You know what? This verse has been used to endorse what's known as forced conversions. A 
of all kinds of people, especially Jews. All kinds of people. A forced conversion. Compel them to come. Don't let them say no. Well, I don't have to tell you that there's nowhere in the Bible that endorses the idea of a forced conversion. It doesn't honor God. It doesn't honor the people that you're ministering to. We invite people. We offer people. We share with people. We do not force people. Because I don't know about your story, but my story... I remember people trying to force me to know who God was. And not only did I not want to know anything about Jesus, I didn't want to know anything about the people who were forcing Jesus on me. But when someone offered Jesus to me, it changes everything. So when you read this verse, urge them to come. It's the idea of praying. And inviting and sharing. It's never the inviting of guilt. It's never the idea of guilt tripping or forcing or demanding. Because the last verse, Luke 14, 24, Jesus said, I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. See, there are people who think that they are owed eternal life. Because of their name, because of their reputation, because of their social standing, because of their income, because of their family heritage. They think God owes them something. And Jesus said, none of those who were invited who turn their back on me will taste of my dinner. These people were invited, according to the parable of Jesus, to a banquet. A banquet with the king. And what did they do? They made up all kinds of excuses as to why they should say no. And why are excuses so dangerous? Because Jesus has paid the price for the banquet. He's the one who has invited us. But no one comes to his banquet except by his invitation. But please understand, there comes a time when the banquet host, after he invites and invites and invites and invites and invites and invites and invites, and I say no and no and no and no, there comes a time when the banquet host is fully right to say, okay. You don't want to come. Don't come. Now, please hear me. It breaks the heart of the inviter when the invitee says no. So here's the question as we finish. Do you know you've been invited to the banquet of King Jesus? And do you know that we are full of silly excuses as to why we should say no? And he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. He says, come to my banquet. Come to my party. And we come up with excuses. Well, I'm too busy in my career and I don't want to give up this or that or, or it doesn't seem like that important to me. We come up with all kinds of excuses. But you need to know. You may be what the world considers the high ranking or the low ranking. But Jesus is inviting you to his banquet today. So the first question is, will you accept his invitation? And the second question is, for those of you who have already said yes to the invitation, will you turn around and invite other people to the banquet? Because the greatest teacher ever says, I don't want any empty seats at my party. Let's pray. As we bow, I'm going to ask some of the folks from our prayer ministry, they're going to come to the front. They'll pray with you afterwards. God, we thank you that you invite us. 
And God, we thank you that in your patience, you invite us again. And you invite us again. And Father, if we're honest, we'll recognize that we come up with some silly excuses to say no to you. Father, would you help us not promote ourselves, but instead humble ourselves and say yes to your invitation. And once we join the family, once we join the party, may we turn around and invite others to your banquet. And this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Have a wonderful week.